I'm Hanna Dovbach, Eurasian Harm Reduction Association, and today we will speak about the um, uh, communi the technologies which are used by some countries and governments uh, to control uh, civil society, to not let civil society to make decisions or to arrest civil societies, uh, civil society community leaders. And um, from my perspective, from as Eurasian Harm Reduction Association, we are working in 29 countries. And we see how governments are learning uh, of these technologies and, and some even small tips how, how to, to control civil society or media, and we will learn uh, what is happening in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, but uh, my feeling is that, that a lot of governments all over the globe uh, learning this from, from our governments. I will give floor to Daniel Huloy uh, from the Amnesty International, and we are very happy to work together on this topic, and I hope that this session will not be the last cooperation in the region and not uh, and on all, all over the globe. I'm passing the mic. Perfect. Thank you very much, Gana, and thank you very much to all the organizers for the opportunity to be on this panel. As you said, and I think I hope this is this is the first of, of many more collaborations. Um, I think this side event comes at a very important moment where civil society organizations and those advocating for drug policy reform are facing increased risks and challenges across the world. Um, but the widespread crackdown that we are seeing over the last few years on the civic space across Eastern Europe and Central Asia is adding an additional layer of concern. Um, this crackdown is, is clearly being fueled to a large degree by Russia's ongoing war against Ukraine, uh, which is driving hardening authoritarian practices across the region, while older systems of repression still remain. Um, so today I want to focus on some patterns that we have documented at Amnesty. Uh, in the region, particularly those obstructing the rights to freedom of association and the right to freedom of expression. Um, while many of the cases that we have documented at Amnesty are not directly related to drug policy, it is clear that those obstacles and those tools for repression are equally hindering the ability of human rights defenders and civil society organizations to promote more humane and rights-respecting drug policies. So I want to highlight three particular strategies uh, that are prevalent in almost every country in the region, albeit to different degrees. Uh, I will first talk about the adoption of laws that stigmatize and criminalize civil society organizations and its members, particularly through foreign agents laws. Uh, the second strategy that we have documented is the way in which these laws in particular are obstructing the ability of civil society organizations to access funding. Um, and the third one that I will highlight is, is a trend to, to further criminalize the right to freedom of expression, particularly through fake news laws uh, and other restrictive policies. Uh, so what we have seen is that since Russia first adopted uh, its foreign agents laws almost a decade, over a decade ago, more and more organizations across the region have been constrained or shut down. Um, Sadly, Russia's legislation is providing a vicious blueprint for the whole region in which an ever-growing number of individuals and organizations are being labeled as foreign agents or undes undesirable. Um, these laws are, are obstructing the work of civil society organizations and directly interfere with the right to association. They are imposing barriers at all stages of the life of an organization, and it's allowing the authorities to monitor and surveil the organizations and its members. This is happening particularly at the point of registration, but it's also happening when organizations plan or conduct their activities, when they seek funds, and when they carry out public campaigning or advocacy. Those who criticize the authorities or who express views at odds with dominant political or social opinions, as we all know, is drug policy. Um, are at special risk. All too often, they are forced to self-center or to scale back their activities, to dedicate their limited resources to defend themselves or to comply with excessive and bureaucratic requirements. And all too often, they are excluded, excluded from funding opportunities. For example, um, hundreds of organizations in Russia have seen their funding shrink, their reputations tarnished, and their operations closed since the foreign agents law was passed. And we have here the Andrew Rilke Foundation who will talk more about their experience about this. Um, many other leading human rights organizations across the region have also been officially dissolved on the pretext of violations of foreign agents regulations. Um, just last year, uh, Russia labeled 54 organizations and 172 individuals as foreign agents, and 56 other organizations were designated as undesirable. 
In similar moves, authorities in Belarus are imposing arbitrary charges of extremism to close civil society organizations, including the prominent human rights center Vyasna. Kyrgyzstan has also unleashed an unprecedented crackdown on civil society organizations with an intensified campaign to stifle all forms of dissent through vaguely defined notions of cultural traditions or national values. Journalists and activists critical of the government are also facing increasing attacks on social media, um, as well as arbitrary detention and unfair trials. Um, as part of this crackdown, governments across the region are also imposing restrictions to the, on the ability of organizations to seek funds. Um, on the one hand, national sources of funding are generally tied to government priorities, and those able to access um, are only those who align with the government priorities. Um, several countries are also imposing illegitimate restrictions on the ability to receive funding from abroad, uh, which has forced many organizations to close. Russia's draconian restrictions on, on foreign funding have, also, have been replicated across the region, including in Azerbaijan, Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Tajikistan. Just last week, Kyrgyzstan adopted a new law obliging all organizations who receive funding from abroad and who engage in vaguely defined political activity to register as foreign representatives. If they fail to register as such, the authorities can close this organization for six months without a court order or completely deregister the organization. A similar law was recently submitted also um, in, by, the, uh, by the Georgian government to parliament, uh, but widespread demonstrations from civil society um, who expressed critical, uh, sorry, who, 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 who criticized this law and, and triggered a massive backlash, forced the government to withdraw um, and recall the draft. Nevertheless, human rights defenders and other civil society actors in the country still face threats, smears, and harassment. The third issue I wanted to, to briefly touch upon is, is the way in which governments are using um, fake, fake news laws, as I was mentioning, to criminalize those who express critical views or even just for sharing information on human rights. Uh, the repression of, of freedom of expression is spiraling uh, with a barrage of charges ranging from extremism to justification of terrorism, going all the way to dissemination of false information or even LGBTI propaganda. Since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, censorship is reaching high, uh, new heights across the region. Azerbaijan, Belarus, Kazakhstan and, and Tajikistan, among other countries, have increasingly detained human rights defenders simply for criticizing the government. Also, we, we documented recently a new law in, in Kazakhstan, for example, that mandates penalties for social media users and even owners of these platforms simply for unintentionally posting or spreading what they call false information. In Belarus, new amendments to the criminal code allow the authorities to bring criminal charges for what they call crimes of an anti-state orientation. Under these reforms, books and other printed materials can be outlawed for futuring what they call extremely, extremist content, while dozens of people have been arrested for su subscribing to extremist telegram channels. Uh, similarly, in Kyrgyzstan, a draft media law intends to outlaw the dissemination of materials that harm the health and morality of the population. Censorship is also running high in Turkmenistan, where the government holds a tight control of information and strictly limits access to the internet. Reporting even on critical issues like shortages of essential food or medicines is highly censored. Um, according to one study, more than 120,000 domains were blocked last year alone, including all WordPress blogs, um, as well as course of news, business and social media sites. Um, so let me just finalize by saying that under international human rights law, there is no doubt that drug policy activists are human rights defenders. And therefore states have a clear obligation to protect all human rights defenders and ensure that drug policy activists have a safe and enabling environment in which we, we can work without fear of reprisals. It is long time for states to start complying with these obligations. Um, and I'll stop there. Um, I know we have very important um, experiences from the region to hear from, so. Thank you very much, Daniel, and thank you for all human rights community supporting uh, drug policy activists in, in this environment. Now, uh, we will have intervention from the HA, uh, from, from the uh, HA Legal Network, uh, from Misha Galichenko, from our expert who, ha who is helping uh, who is a Russian um, lawyer and he, he is helping a lot of community leaders 
in, in the um, uh, strategic litigation, but in the same time, he, we ask him to, to make the, uh, the broad analysis what other mechanisms are used against the activists. Good day, everyone. My name is Mikhail Golichenko. I am a Russian and Canadian lawyer working for HIV Legal Network based in Toronto, Canada. The recent surge in laws targeting foreign agents across several countries in the Eastern Europe and Central Asia region possess significant threat to drug policy reforms. Countries such as Russia, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, and even Georgia have either implemented or considered implementing such legislation. These laws, ostensibly aimed at safeguarding national sovereignty, have far-reaching implications, particularly for initiatives seeking to reform drug policies towards a more humane and evidence-based approach. Drug policy reforms, which advocate for measures like decriminalization of drug use and possession, alongside improving access to harm reduction and opioid maintenance therapy, are often viewed as foreign concepts by conservative governments in the ECA region. Traditional attitudes lean heavily towards punitive measures and stigmatization of drug users. Thus, any deviation from this punitive approach is often seen as an encroachment of foreign ideals. Civil society organizations and activists championing drug policy reforms become prime target under laws targeting foreign agents. These organizations, often reliant on international support and collaboration, are now forced to navigate a landscape of hate and scrutiny and suspicion. Fearing repercussions, many may resort to self-censorship, effectively halting their advocacy effort altogether. This stifling of civil society undermines the democratic principles these governments claim to uphold. The consequence of such crackdowns on foreign influence is the regression in drug policy reforms. Instead of progressing towards more compassionate and effective approach to drug use, these countries are forced into a narrow corridor of policy options. While some limited efforts may be made towards providing health services and alternatives to incarceration, the overarching stigma and punishment associated with drug use remain largely unchanged. Decriminalization and decarceration efforts are likely to be severely constrained, if not abandoned altogether. The prospect of maintaining stigmatizing policies such as narcological registries persists, further marginalizing individuals struggling with drug dependency. This not only exacerbates public health challenges, but also perpetuates cycles of poverty, discrimination, and incarceration. Moreover, the narrative of foreign interference conveniently deflects attention from domestic issues and fails to address the root causes of drug-related problems. By scapegoating external influences, governments in the Eastern European and Central Asian region evade accountability for failing to implement evidence-based policies that prioritize the well-being of their citizens. The implications extend beyond domestic borders, affecting regional cooperation and global efforts to combat drug trafficking and substance abuse. By alienating international partners, and restricting civil society's ability to advocate for reforms, these countries isolate themselves from valuable resources and expertise. In conclusion, laws targeting foreign agents in the Eastern European and Central Asian region represent a significant setback for drug policy reforms. By stifling civil society and perpetuating punitive approaches to drug use, these laws undermine efforts to address substance abuse in a comprehensive and humane manner. Moving forward, it's imperative for governments in the region to prioritize evidence-based policies and meaningful engagement with stakeholders, effectively tackling complex challenges related to drug use. Thank you for your attention and good luck with your session. Bye. Unfortunately, Misha could not come to the session with us, uh, but uh, actually in everyday life, we are working with him country by country, ensuring uh, safety of activists, uh, possible ways, as well as with frontline defenders, with amnesty, with other human rights activists, ensuring uh, possible ways for activists to avoid the punishment or uh, 
if in in very crisis moment to, to have the evacuation to the other countries but that's also all this um bring us to the, to the problem what will happen with the uh, people who use drugs in the country when all active and vocal activists and civil society will be forced out of the country. And that's actually all the time uh, the ethical dilemma to stay in country in the danger to provide services and or to go out. And now uh, we are coming to the country who are learning <laughs> of these technologies. Sorry, I'm, I'm too judgmental today. Thank you so much, Hannah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I don't say I'm happy to speak today here about my unhappy country or that my country joined this group of unhappy countries. Um, when I came here first time at the CND 20 years ago in 2004, my country was freshly joined the European Union and we belong to a group of progressive countries. But at the moment, it's the situation completely changed and I'm, unfortunately we are on the same road or we follow the same script what you could see uh, in Russia although it's much less harsh and you know Hungary is a very small country but why it's it can be interesting it's it's used as a testing ground for this kind of Russian types uh, anti-NGO policies within the European Union uh, so what do we mean by a shrinking space of civil society when when we when we speak about the crackdown of on civil society in Hungary. We, as NGOs, we experience this at several levels. So first, uh, the media space is shrinking for us. So like 10 or 20 years ago, we had plenty of opportunity to speak at the uh, media. Uh, right now, the media, most of the media is controlled by the government and we don't have anymore any kind of opportunities to go to television. And there are, most of the media does not really um, give a voice to civil society and some parts of the media actually actively uh, scapegoating NGOs and uh, doing fear mongering against uh, especially uh, those NGOs who are working with uh, marginalized uh, populations. So at that, uh, another level is the funding space. So there is less and less funding for at least secular based uh, organizations. The faith based organizations is a different issue. They have plenty of funding. And, and also the access to international funding is restricted so that if you receive international funding, you are scapegoated. Again, uh, there is a, a shrinking political space. So NGOs are excluded from uh, all kinds of decision-making preparation procedures. Uh, and I should mention that we also have um, uh, uh, so, so the government creates its own gongos, government uh, or, or organize organizations that are trying to replace uh, NGOs in, in fields. For example, in the field of drug policy, there is a newly established gongo in Hungary that is only established to oppose uh, the voice of uh, Hamid Action or drug policy reform organizations with very good funding. Uh, and. Uh, and there is also a, a, a shrinking legal space, so there are repressive new laws and, uh, and also financial investigations against, uh, against those organizations that are, let's say, undesirable for, for, the, for, the, for the government. Uh, it, this is a short timeline how uh, the crackdown on, on civil society looked in, or, or started in Hungary, started in 2013 with a kind of uh, mass media campaign against those NGOs that receive money from international donors, especially George Soros, who is a you know, Hungarian-born philanthropist, uh, a creator of the Open Society Foundation. And uh, you know the absurdity of the situation is that he paid for the stipends of the current Prime Minister of Hungary when he studied in Oxford. Uh, and then the Prime Minister turned against him. Uh, so. Uh, then a year after uh, there was a, an attack on uh, those organizations that receive funding from the Norway grants and actually Hungary effectively blocked 
uh, money coming through the Norway grant to civil society and the NGO that was distributing these funds in Hungary there was a uh, there was a, a financial investigation the, per, uh, the one of the uh, uh, staff member of this organization was arrested and their tax, tax number was uh, suspended. And, and the same year in 2014, we also witnessed uh, an attack or crackdown on harm reduction in Hungary. So the two largest harm reduction programs were shut down. Actually, those needle and syringe programs that provided uh, half, more than half of the sterile needles in Hungary shut down from uh, uh, one week to another, leaving thousands of people use drugs without any kind of access to services. And then in, to in 2017, we had a law uh, on, uh, let's say, we called it foreign agent law. It was modeled after the Russian law, but because we are in the European Union, they could not make it as harsh as in, in Russia. But they, the, the, the aim was the same, so to scapegoat NGOs and list, list all those NGOs. That, so you had to disclaim if you receive money from uh, foreign, foreign donors, and then there was a blacklist on a ministry website, and you were put on that, and the, uh, there was an expected chilling effect of that. Uh, and in 2018, the Central European University, which is a private university, was for, forced out from Hungary, and it left Hungary to, to Vienna. And we also had a, an anti-LGBTQ law, uh, that was also directed against uh, civil society because it banned uh, all civil society organizations from going to school to do drug prevention and sex, edu sex education. And still, it's not it's only faith-based organizations and the police is allowed to go to uh, schools. And there is a complete ban on uh, talking about um, LGBTQ issues at school, in schools. So the Florida say no gay law, that was modeled after this Hungarian uh, one. So that's an example how a small country like Hungary can be a cheerleader of this kind of, you know, conservative movements around the world. And the, the newest development was, uh, end of last year, they created a new authority, a sovereign defense authority, which is protecting the sovereignty of Hungary and aiming to uh, monitor and investigate all those NGOs that serve foreign interests. And of course, they decide who is those organizations, probably us uh, included. So. Um, I would like to recommend you to read a report and, and, and see uh, or, or, or watch uh, a video uh, on, on the shrinking space for civil society in our region. It was, um, uh, the report is called the F We Fight, We Hide, We Unite. And we also made a video, the crackdown on civil society. If you search on YouTube, you will find it with several interviews and, and it's, it's pretty interesting stories about how, how NGOs live this in, in everyday life. So this, this report uh, identified actually, and I think that's a very good uh, uh, categorization, that it, uh, it identified three types of uh, response from civil society responding to this crackdown. And one, the first is like fighting, so those NGOs who are opposing the uh, government. Then so some of NGOs, and, and there are, I'm, 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 I think, much more uh, NGOs who are hiding. They are kind of abandoning all kind of public advocacy. Let's, you know, be invisible, just doing our services. We don't speak to the media, this type of uh, attitude. And then there is the unite attitude when they try to make a compromise with, with, with the authorities and um, uh, a good example in Hungary is that some organization, harm reduction organizations, reframed their work as recovery, and they don't uh, allow. They are not allowed to speak about harm reduction. They use uh, some resources to do harm reduction, but they never speak about it because if you submit any grant application to the government, you should not mention the word harm reduction, needle, or nothing like that because you will not receive any kind of money. Uh, so about how we try to fight back, my organization was one of those who were fighting back. Uh, for example, in 2014, when the, there was an attack against uh, harm reduction programs, we uh, organized a, a campaign in, in Budapest uh, for harm reduction. We were going to the streets, 
had a petition. Uh, we used all kinds of uh, platforms to promote uh, harm reduction. We also used some legal channels of complaint, like the Ombudsman for Fundamental Rights, who actually condemned the closure of the Netherlands Syringe programs in Hungary as the as a violation of the right to health and the right to healthy environment for people who are living around. Uh, which was a, a big win. Um, and also sometimes in, in this growing authoritarianism or, or countries with gross, growing authoritarianism, sometimes you find allies in the local level. So in, if, 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 if you still have some local municipalities who are still a bit more liberal or progressive. So if you could, for example, we could uh, uh, co cooperate with the Budapest uh, municipality and created uh, last year a very progressive drug strategy, at least for, for Budapest, with some local level funding. So that was a, a good opportunity. And, and also, I think uh, one opportunity to fight back is also co if you coordinate civil society activities. So, I mean, that is a kind of unintended benefit of, of this uh, crackdown on NGOs that we are more organized than ever, like the, the civil society itself. So we have some networks and we, we, we really act collectively. That was also a, a huge demonstration for civil society in Budapest. Uh, we, we had a strategic litigation case and in 2020, the Court of Justice of the European Union actually annulled the, the law, the foreign agent law, and, uh, and it was repealed in Hungary. So that was, uh, I think, a big success. Uh, it will be replicated in another form, but it also shows that in the European Union still you can, can't do the same as in Russia, for example. There are still some kind of rule of law. At the same time, I'm not, not very happy with how the European Union responding to these violations. I think this mechanisms should be used much, it could, could be used much, much more. Um, and uh, I, I, in the end, finally, I would like to recommend you a report we published with the Civil Society Forum on Drugs. That's an advisory body for the European Commission. It's about the quality standards of civil society involvement in drug policies. It is a kind of guideline for both decision makers and civil society about what, how, what, the, what do we mean by a meaningful involvement? How you can, you know, give a content, a substance to, to this word meaningfully involved. So I, I recommend you to read that report and use it in your own uh, countries. And the final word is that I think policy making should not be the privilege of uh, a political class. There is no democracy without a vibrant civil society and freedom of association, as Daniel also mentioned, is a very key human right, and, and we cannot have any progress in drug policy without guaranteeing that, that right. Thank you very much. Thank you, our dear panelists. And now we have some time for comments, questions, because we have people here in the room from different countries. And maybe you need to know a bit more about how this technology is working to be prepared to push back. Some, some questions, comments, do you have? Yes, please. A question and a comment, or the other way around. Thank you. Uh, Magdalena Dombkowska, Helsinki Foundation for Human Rights in Poland. I first of all, uh, thank you very much for putting that panel together. I'm really happy to see more and more side events uh, focusing on human rights on one hand and on the region on the other hand at the CND. So thank you for that. Uh, thank you very much to Peter for mentioning our report, We Fight, We Hide and We Unite. I had the pleasure to co-author that. And so one comment about the report and a bit more general maybe. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, there are three different categories. This is of course the simplification that we use to, to divide um, or categorize different movements. And I just would really like to, to say that clearly that the intention was not and has never been to uh, judge NGOs on the basis of which strategy they choose. And there's a lot of respect to all of them that stay involved in this way or another. And a lot of understanding that sometimes the circumstances are so difficult that we have to make this super difficult decision on how you want to operate if this is still possible um, at all. And uh, the report at the very end has also uh, the part with, where we tried to discuss with donors what their strategies 
are or might be when it comes to supporting civil society when the space um, is shrinking. Uh, so m my question actually comes to you a little bit from that perspective, not only about donors. I mean, finances are always an issue, but we also heard how difficult it is to obtain finances. But I mean, is there still anything that you feel the international community could do to support civil society in these countries where the space is so limited or almost non-existent today. First, Palanina Rayanen from uh, Malaysia, um, Drug Policy Program in Malaysia. Um, Anya just wanted to um, pay respect and say for all the work that you've done with RAF, um, I know that it's closing and I know that it breaks your heart, but we in the international uh, the international community know the work that um, you have done and the w and and the achievements and the contributions that you have made to the harm reduction learning for all of us um, and the thousands of lives that you have saved. So thank you for for all of that. M but similar question. It's not just what the international community can do in shrinking spaces, but if you looked back, Anya, is there anything else that the international community could have done more? to support, um, you know, leading to the closure. You know, uh, could, it, could we have done anything more? It, could anyone have done anything more? Uh, um, unfortunately, uh, the, exactly the same time period when uh, this crackdown on NGO started, uh, we could also see the retreat of interna several international donors from especially Eastern Central Europe. So the you know, collapse of harm reduction did not only happen in Hungary, but in several other countries. We see that we, we filmed with my colleague, we filmed that in, uh, in the Balkan, Serbia, Bosnia, so the harm reduction programs collapsed from one year to another because of lack of uh, funding. And uh, it's not only, unfortunately, not only the global fund, but other international donors. It's, it's, it's much difficult to, to get money from other international donors as well. Um, at the European Union level, like uh, European Commission uh, used to give uh, funding for civil society uh, dedicated on like harm reduction and, and human rights. Right now, there is a shift to a security agenda, security-based agenda at the European Commission, and uh, those grants are actually over, so we don't have any more. So it's, uh, you know, the, what we see is that and at one side, we had this on, on the government is, uh, is, <laughs> is having a crackdown on civil society. At the same time, it was also uh, uh, less and less access for, to, uh, to support and uh, funding from the international donors. So it was a very unlucky pairing <laughs> or very unlucky <laughs> circumstance. Um. I mean, a lot something I, I don't think I can say anything more than what local civil society have said. And I think, as, as Anne was saying, is we, we must be guided by the voices and, and the needs of, of people who are facing this, this, this backlash and, and this crackdown on the ground. Um, but one thing that I think we have learned and, and, and we have seen is that, I mean, voices uh, from the international community at this moment, when, when, when the shrinking space is so critical and the society is so closed, or the authorities have closed the, the space for civil society so much in those countries, it's even more and more important for, for, for the international community to keep, to keep talking and to keep raising their voices, uh, both at the multilateral level. So for example, we have seen efforts at the Human Rights Council that sometimes doesn't reach as far as we would want. Um, I mean, I think it was a very important achievement to establish the UN Special Rapporteur on Russia, for example, as, as keeping that I don't know if last, but like one of the last safeguards and uh, lifelines for, for civil society on the ground. We need to, to, to have much more of these mechanisms to give visibility and to give accountability for what is happening in these closed societies. But also, we need voices from the international community at the country level. And I think, I mean, as many civil society organizations and, and, and actors are leaving, the country's diplomatic delegations are still there. They still have a voice to keep raising their voices within Russia, within any of these countries. The EU has an amazing guidelines for, for human rights defenders. They do have the re responsibility to accompany those who are still in the country, to go to the trials, to raise these issues with, with, with the authorities. When our voices are being silenced, they still have a very voice, like powerful voice to, to, to raise. Um, and to me, the, 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 the last idea I wanted to raise is I think there is also something for us as, as civil society organizations to make sure that these mechanisms, I'm thinking more at the UN, like this whole 
range of, 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 of special rapporteurs and, and treaty bodies are paying attention to the issues of drug policy. We have been trying and we have been making advancements, but for example, the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Defenders hardly has, has spoken about human rights defenders in drug policy, for example. So I think we need to be making these connections much more, and I think those mechanisms also have a responsibility to be looking more at the region. I have to conclude the, the session with some, uh, again, the, the summary from us as a Eurasian Harm Reduction Association. We are really uh, afraid of what is happening and sometimes it feels for me that one party started the Cold War and the other party just relax and, and imagine that this party is not exist. So, so uh, we are grateful to European Union or to NATO to, for, for uh, arms support uh, to Ukraine, but politically, and donor wise and uh, with the reflection what is happening uh, it seems like European countries they are saying okay security is a weapon but in in fact if we will be back to, to the same mechanism against the civil society, starting with LGBT, starting with the homophobia law, with the drug phobia law, with the foreign agent and alienating everyone who is thinking in a bad mood or, or with wrong narrative, we saw it in history. And not cooperated, not coordinated effort of all those who are who, who who are united by the values of human rights and and human dignity. That's really caused a lot of lost lives and a lot of lost freedom and arrested people. So, so for us, it is important now to, to ring a bell, to, to say that, that we need to come to the Security Council, we need to come to the European Parliament, and not just for one sentence in some decision, but really wise thinking, are we ready for the Iron Curtain to go down? Are, and what we are doing coordinatedly to, to, to provide information behind, to save activists behind, and to support civil society who are doing important work uh, for the harm reduction and for saving people. Thank you very much for being with us. It's just the start of the dialogue. We will be strong. Thank you. Then thank you, our finalists. <laughs>